Today on In Good Faith, we're having one of our quarterly episodes that I look forward to most, which is a book club episode. A chance for us and then our readers as well to all have read the same book and then have a discussion that we hope as you're listening, you feel part of because of having read the book. Or if you're cheating and you just want to learn about a book and decide if you're going to read it, that works too. (laughs) Our guest today in studio is Dr. Ravi Gupta. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be back. Yeah. Previous guest, he was uh, on episode 75 in season four. Ravi M. Gupta holds the Charles Red Chair of Religious Studies and serves as professor and department head of the Department of History at Utah State University in Logan, Utah. He's the author of an abridged translation of the Bhagavata Purana. Yes, good with Kenneth Valpy, published in 2017 by Columbia University Press. Dr. Gupta is a permanent research fellow of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies and a past president of the Society for Hindu Christian Studies. We are talking today about the Bhagavad Gita. More about that in just one second. We're using a translation by Dr. Laurie Patton, also a previous guest on our show in episode 76 of season 4. This is the Bhagavad Gita, published with Penguin Classics in 2008. With us today, our senior producer, Heather Bigley. Hello, very excited to be here. Also, Ashton Rowan. Hi, thanks, Steve. And Leah King. Hello, good morning. A few preliminary things, if you would, Dr. Gupta. Um, How does this fit in Hindu scripture? Because there's the Upanishads and the Vedas and the Mahabharata, all of these terms we hear. In a nutshell, can you tell us where this fits in? Yeah, uh, so the canon of scripture in Hinduism is quite vast. Um, There's many different texts and different branches of Hinduism, different traditions will hold different works to be very important. The Bhagavad Gita over the centuries has really emerged as a jewel of India's spiritual wisdom, one that's very widely accepted and respected and read and known in popular culture as well. And and so when you look at all the different texts that exist, there are the Vedas, which are the oldest texts within Hinduism in the Sanskrit language. Um, and at the end of the Vedas, you have the Upanishads. Um, and then you have a set of texts which are um, like um, ancient histories uh, where you have um, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. So the Bhagavad Gita is 700 verses, 18 chapters, within the Mahabharata, which is a huge work. It's the largest epic text in the world, 100,000 verses, give or take, in length. So this is a tiny sliver of a very large work, and yet it has been read and published apart from that, separately as an independent work, for many, many centuries. And before we dive in, I have to ask, because we've picked a translation, which I believe you also use in class. I do, This very same one. Can the translation really capture what's in the original? That's the eternal question. Yeah. Um, so uh, every translation is an interpretation. It provides us a certain understanding of the Sanskrit. Um, you have to make certain choices as a translator. And I've done a lot of translating, and some of those choices can be really, really difficult because um, sometimes you're trying to convey the poetic quality of it, uh, but in the process you lose some of the clarity of the of the direct meaning. Or sometimes you're trying to emphasize the clarity of the point being made, but you lose the poetic alliteration or its rhythm, right? So uh, Bhagavad Gita is a work of poetry. The word Gita means song. It's the song of God. And as a song, any song in translation is going to lose something in the process but also gain something, as in when you put something in another language, you pick up certain flavors and attributes in the host language as well that add something to the long tradition of the text's life. So you're you're losing something, but you're also gaining something. And in this way, the Bhagavad Gita continues to live. Well, I kind of like that there's this built-in impossibility of perfection. Yes. (laughs) That gives place for all of us. What we have done, uh, Ravi, is 
besides reading as much as we could, also we've each picked one of the discourses to sort of say, I'm going to really dive even deeper into this one. And we may have questions, and I think those will come up. But when you are starting students on this, is there something that you tell them at the very beginning, like keep this in mind or watch for this? Or do you just say, here's a blank slate? Yeah, that's a great question. And I just this semester, I finished... Um, uh, on Tuesday, I finished teaching a course that was half about the Upanishads and half about the Bhagavad Gita. And definitely there was something I started with. And it's just this very simple point, which is to say the Bhagavad Gita is not an essay. It's not an article. It's not a speech. It's not a sermon. It's a conversation. It's a conversation between two people. And that is extremely important because Krishna doesn't always give his his most pressing or most interesting or most convincing or his highest teaching every time he speaks. He says something and it bounces off Arjuna and Arjuna says, oh, I don't know, that, that didn't make sense to me. Can you explain it differently? And Krishna says, okay, let me try again, right? And this means that every chapter of the Gita makes sense and strikes someone. But some chapters strike a person more than others. And that's because it's a conversation. And like any conversation, like our conversation, it's going to have waves and we're going to take digressions and there's going to be interesting things and maybe a few boring moments, right? So it, it has that quality to it rather than an essay that you makes an argument from start to finish. That's, that's not the Bhagavad Gita. Ah. I love that conversational quality. For people who don't know, th these verses, um, we, let's tell them the narrative, right? So we have Arjuna who has uh, gathered with his brothers to fight his cousins and his uncles. And he comes out onto the battlefield and he looks around and he sees essentially both sides of this battle are comprised by family members, friends, community members. And he, and I find this very touching. He, he goes and says to Krishna, who at this time he thinks of as like his bodyguard and, you know, charioteer, I don't think we should be doing this. This actually seems horrible, what we're about to be engaged in. And then Krishna is going to take him through a series of sort of recontextualizations, if you will, of like what, what he's about to be engaged in. So I think that's really important. Um, and one of my questions is, as I sort of said at the beginning of this, a lot of the people that I know who have read the Bhagavad Gita have been white American men who sort of come away and go, I too am a warrior. Um, <laughs> and and um, I think there's an interesting thing here about, yes, Arjuna is a warrior and Krishna speaks to him as a warrior, but we're not all warriors. And and the readership who would have been exposed to this wouldn't are, don't think of them all as warriors. So I, I am interested in when we talk about this, if we're not a warrior, What's in here for us? And I think there's plenty, but I kind of am interested in that. Like, what do we find for ourselves? Because I don't think of myself as a warrior, right? Yeah, uh, that's, that's, uh, that actually, th that's the second thing that I tell people when I begin teaching them the Bhagavad Gita. The first thing is that it's a conversation. The second thing is you can't understand the Bhagavad Gita without understanding the larger story in which it exists, the context of the Mahabharata, <clears throat> which is a long story, but it's, it's, uh, it's crucial to understanding why Krishna is coming at this topic in the way he is. So I'm, I'm really happy, Heather, that you brought that point up uh, because it's important to understand that the Bhagavad Gita is not an, a text of armchair philosophy. It's not written in, in some philosopher's fireplace, you know, mm -hmm. uh, relaxed and, and thinking about the great things in life. It's a book about living life in the world. It's a book about practice. But Krishna's point to Arjuna is that if you need to solve the most difficult problems you face in your day-to-day -day life, in order to solve those problems, you have to step away from them. You, the same consciousness, the same mindset that got you into the problem is not going to solve it for you. You have, to, you have to think bigger. You have to think broader. You have to think deeper. And so that's the message, I think, for all of us who aren't warriors, who yeah. aren't soldiers, right? To say that whatever my challenges are in life, and we all have those challenges, the Bhagavad Gita allows us to take a step 
back from that and to think about questions that will actually inform our response to the world. Who am I? What is the purpose of life? Why am I suffering? What's the solution to my suffering? What's the long-term goal that I have? Do I work for a higher purpose or not? Those are the sorts of questions that in, can inform everything we do, even if we're not soldiers. I, but, and that was one of—I I kind of had that same question because it seems like, he, in some ways, Krishna is saying, you have a place and a function. You should fill that place and fulfill that function. Yes. And and I thought, how does he learn that? Is it is it simply by virtue of birth or placement, or is there something that brings him to be who he is and have the task he has? Mm. Which which is the question I ask myself. <laughs> and and in some sense, it's our perennial question in life, right? Mm. We we go through our lives really trying to figure out who we are and what's the contribution that we're meant to make in this world. Um, some of it might be uh, determined by birth. So the fact that I'm born in the United States, the, f- the fact that I have a certain set of parents and a, and a certain background means that I've been given a tool set, right, from very early on, a certain set of skills, a particular kind of body that is um, going to help me do certain things and not help me do other things. At the same time, that's just a toolkit. And what you make with those tools is really up to you in in this life. And I think that's Krishna's message about dharma and about duty and about action, karma, in this world, is that we have the capacity to create our future, create our world, create our lives in a meaningful way. But that takes a while to discover. It's not something that's handed, as we can tell with Arjuna, yeah, yeah. he's having trouble discovering this. And he's got God right in front of him, talking to him. Uh, most of us don't have that privilege. And so it might take us a while to figure <laughs> out who we are. With these 18 discourses, we each kind of picked one that that we thought was maybe going to speak to us. And I'm curious to hear how that turned out. And I wonder if we can, should we go? uh, Let's start with Leah, yeah. Leah, let's, yeah. Was number three, I think. Yeah, so I did Discourse 3, and I chose it for a few reasons. I really liked a lot of what it said, but also I saw the most parallels to the Bible in the third discourse, and so I wanted to speak to that. So I'm excited to hear all of your thoughts. Well, what, what, was there a particular verse in three or several verses that you really liked? Take us there. Yeah, so third discourse, verse 11. It says, By this may you cause the gods to be, and may the gods cause you to be. Both sustaining each other, you will reach the higher good. And I like this idea of you give to the gods, and then they give something back to you. In the LDS tradition, it reminded me of covenants. Like, you promise something, and then in return, you are promised something, but that's only upheld when both people keep their part of the promise. Yeah, I think there's... um, So I'm looking at 19 in the third discourse. When Mm -hmm. one performs actions to be done without clinging, one attains the highest. And this word clinging shows up throughout the piece, um, the text. And uh, I think Krishna has to keep defining it and keep explaining it. And for me as a Westerner, Clinging sounds good. <laughs> so I too had to had to keep learning what that meant, um, and that's kind of I I, I mean I want to talk about that word clinging. Why why is it so central? I mean it's connected that, to desire. Is that where he talks later about doing the action but letting go of demanding the fruits of it? Yes, yeah. yes. and and I think that connects both Heather what you're saying and what what Leah's saying is that is that both of these verses are talking about this idea that when we exist in the world, we have certain responsibilities, right? And that responsibilities are to ourselves, to each other, to, to, the, to the gods above us, to God himself as, a, as kind of a supreme deity. So the Bhagavad Gita has a very rich understanding of the cosmos, and our place in it means that we have something to give and something to receive as part of that. We're receiving all the time, right? But but when we act in a way 
that where we're acting out of selfish motive, I do this because I want this from it. Mm. Um, then that tinges our action in such a way that we're able to less contribute to the world. We're not able to give as much as we can. But when we act in a selfless capacity, where I'm doing this because this is the right thing to do, or I'm doing it for the love of God, or I'm doing it because I want to help others, then that quality takes, that action takes on a transcendent quality. It takes on a sublime aspect, which allows us to, to, to be better than, than, than ourselves. Mm. What, what else from three? Oh, go ahead, Ashton. Yeah, um, one, a couple verses that I highlighted in here that really touched on this point to me um, and kind of helped me get a better grasp on what Krishna was trying to say is in the very first verse of the third discourse, Arjuna asks, why do you enjoin me to such terrible action? He says, you know, if your insight is stronger than action, then why are you asking me to do such a terrible thing? And I, he, you know, Krishna explains this in depth, but I think one verse that really helped draw it out was verse 25. He says, so the wise should act without clinging, but rather wanting to keep the world collected together. And this just really made me think about Arjuna's dharma, his duty, his role on this earth was to be a warrior and to keep the world collected together in that way. And he felt that he had to do this terrible action to do so. And Krishna helps him to understand that it was his role to keep the world collected together. That was his part in that work. So he's not saying, I simply must have all the power I possibly can have. He's trying... He's doing the same actions, trying to conquer this other army, but for a different purpose. Yeah. And, and, and the purpose there, that, that the verse you pointed out is actually really important. It's a famous verse. The, the, word, the last two words of that verse are loka sangraham. And loka sangraham, sangraham mean to world care, essentially, to hold the world together. So, and, and that sense of loka sangraha is what motivates even a person who is without clinging to act in the world. If I don't cling to things, why should I do anything? Why should I come here and talk to all of you, right? <laughs> and the answer is because it's, it's good for the world, and what's good for the world is also good for me, right? And, and that's what Krishna is telling Arjuna, is that you don't have to engage in this battle for selfish reasons, because you want wealth or power. You can act in this battle for the care of the world, right? And that's how we enter action. That's karma yoga. Well, and I think one of the things that um, Steve and I were talking about earlier was I think a Western uh, conception of Hinduism and of uh, India is this idea of peace, nonviolence. And so to come across a text that says, no, no, <laughs> get your sword out and yes. get ready, yeah. I think that's sort of a shock for us. Um, so I guess... I don't know how to say, how do you get from millennia ago to this <laughs> current American conception of India? But, um, you know, wh what would you say to people who are like, wait a minute, this isn't what I expected at all? Yeah, and and I think part of that is this um, notion of Orientalism that, that colors so much of our understanding of the East yeah. in general, right? That that it's a place of harmony and of peace and and softness and everything kind of just flows, uh, whereas the West is a place of building and construction and uh, uh, um, uh, aspirations and growth and ambition. And, and that understanding, I think, is very problematic because you find all these elements in, in, in all different cultures. They just show up in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. So the question of why Krishna is asking Arjuna to fight in the Bhagavad Gita is one that Hindus themselves think about a lot. And, and for, for a lot of Hindus, Krishna's point is not that we should all go out and, and pick up you know, swords and, and, and start fighting. The point is, you, we have to do our role in this world, our duty in this world, our dharma, even when it's tough, even when it's difficult. And Arjuna was put, if you know the story of the Mahabharata, Arjuna was put in a very, very difficult spot. This whole civilization, society, depended on him to rid it of the tyranny of evil forces. And yet those evil forces showed up as 
members of his own extended family. And that that's, you know, hopefully none of us have to face that ever. But that was a really tough spot for him to be in. And that's the message that Hindus take away from it, is that we're all going to encounter difficult choices in our life where we are torn between different obligations and what we feel like doing and what we don't want to do. And that's what the Gita is a guide for. This is a book club edition of In Good Faith, and we're talking about Laurie Patton's translation of the Bhagavad Gita with Dr. Ravi Gupta, and we'll be back with more in just a moment. I'm Stephen Cap Perry, host of In Good Faith. We have another podcast in our BYU radio family of podcasts. It's called The Appleseed. It's a way to take a journey anytime you would like with stories, nationally known storytellers telling everything from folk tales and fairy tales, personal stories, and family tales. It's a great way to get everybody laughing or thinking about some particular topic, and it almost always leads to conversations in the family. If you hit pause after a story and say, what did you think about that? And boy, what does that remind you of? That is a fun time to get to share each other's stories, and that's what the Appleseed does. Check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This is In Good Faith, and on our book club edition, we're discussing a translation of the Bhagavad Gita with Dr. Ravi Gupta. And uh, Heather, I cut you off right oh, before the break. I was just going to say, Leah, so what other, so still in three, yep. what other uh, parallels did you see or what else did you want to talk about? Yeah, so let's go back to one. I'm going to follow Ashton a little bit. If you are a longtime listener, you may know that my major is in the linguistics department. So I spend a lot of my time looking at words and breaking them apart. And so in verse 1, when he says, Enjoin me to such terrible action, there's a footnote in this translation, and it talks about how there's a double meaning of terrible and sublime. And it reminds me of the word awful. So you think of awe, which is amazing, and awesome, which is amazing, and then awful, we use as a negative word, which is interesting because it has that same root. Um, Awful actually stems from kind of a divine fear of God. And it's like something awful happened, which means it was full of awe, but kind of terrifying. And I think it's that same idea in verse one. That's brilliant. That's really, really brilliant. And and I think that very point shows up very clearly in chapter 11. Mm -hmm. When Krishna shows his cosmic form, then that form is awful. It's awesome, right? It's full of awe, and that makes it divine, and that makes it wonderful, and it makes it very frightening for Arjuna. And so that that's a great example of what you just said. Yeah, yeah that word sublime, I mean— historically has its own, like, etymologies, right? And so we get this idea of, like, terror. The natural world uh, is something that we should fear, um, but also it's also transcendent. It takes us to that fear and that that terror, uh, take us to another place, take us outside of ourselves so we can better understand our relationship and we can better understand reality. I, I think I've heard the two words that God works in awful majesty. Mm-hmm. Kind of combining two very strange words, uh, incompatible words to become something overwhelming. Mm. And in chemistry, sublime is uh, 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 when a process by which a liquid goes uh, or a solid goes straight to a gas oh, rather wow. than than, than um, passing this in-between stage. So that's connected to this idea of transcendence, right? That it, it immediately sublimates, essentially. Huh. Very cool. Just in the interest of time, I want to move through a few more sections. Heather, did you have a particular discourse you picked? No, I read or? the whole thing. So. Okay, <laughs> good, good. We could go to Ashton. Well, or, no, or we no, could go to me. No, that sounded like a dig. What I wanted to say was... <laughs> I read the whole thing as well. I, so did I. I. What I want to say is I didn't concentrate because I was just like... I mean, 9 through 12, I thought were fantastic. The imagery there is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm ready to talk about anything. I have some things about 11. Which, 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 and it's in this area where... As he gets taught, as he's walked through his questions and all of this, Arjuna finally, it seems, it dawns on him, eventually, I'm talking to someone more than, than I thought I was talking to. He realizes who it is, and he, he actually asks, can I see you in your actual or your true or your most powerful form? Mm-hmm. 
speaking of awful and, <laughs> and majestic. Uh, and, and so uh, he's told this interesting thing. This is 11th Discourse in 8. It says, uh, but you are not able to see me with your own eye, so I will give to you the divine eye. See my powerful yoga. So you, this is not something you can even comprehend on your own, but I can help you. And I, I find that interesting that there is there can be divine help in our search mm-hmm. for for what is real. Yeah, the Gita as a text is 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 very significant in Hindu history, in textual history in Hinduism, because it so much emphasizes the element of grace, right? Mm-hmm. That that the the individual search it can be helped it can be god is there to not just receive our homage and our devotion but also to give us his love and his mercy and his grace and as we progress through the gita so heather you mentioned chapters 9 through 12 right you can really see that element of grace and god's own personality and his sense of affection for us emerge in a way that doesn't emerge as clearly in the earlier chapters of the gita and he really says that to arjuna because of the way you follow me i i kind of like you yes. i mean that's not the exact translation <laughs> but but as long as we're that. doing translating that's what i get is like there's something about you that you're quite precious to me. Yes. And in fact, that's the final teaching of the Gita. If you go to chapter 18, the very last verses before, actually it's after. Krishna says, I'm done now with, with what I wanted to tell you. Now you think this through and do what you like. It's your choice. The, the phrase is, Yathechasi tathakuru. As you wish, so you do. So he gives him the choice. And then... After he says, now it's up to you, he says, but, but here, here again, my supreme instruction, my highest teaching, and that highest teaching is just what you said, which is, I'm giving you this highest teaching because you are so much loved by me, because yeah. I love you so much, I care for you so much, I'm going to now repeat what I think you should do. It's like a parent who tells their teenager, look, I've given you everything I, I can. You've, you've, you've grown up now. You're an adult. Now, make your own choices. Make your own mistakes. Go out in the world. And you, you barely take your first step outside of the home and make your first choice. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. wait. D- don't do that. Right? Like, that's not good. Because they care too much, right? I mean, that's the most charitable interpretation is, th- is they really care. And Krishna's kind of like that. He says, he t- keeps telling Arjuna, you can do what you want. But, but, but here's, here's what I think you should really do because I love you a lot. Okay, 11. Well, we could do a whole thing on each of these <laughs> oh, discourses. <yeah. laughs> so, so hopefully this will be sparking people's interest to really kind of dive in. But uh, two, th- two things. In uh, 29 and 30, uh, there's so much here, but I just underlined the words worlds. So two worlds rush to death in your mouths. Mm-hmm. Vishnu your mouth's there, flames licking the worlds, talking about just this endless cycle of, of kind of devouring what is and then producing something new. But this is from so long ago, and and it's worlds. It's not those twinkly things in the sky. It's it's worlds. And so there was this concept here of, and there are probably other people on, on these other worlds, and you are you are the master of them all. Yeah, that the, the the Hindu cosmos is very vast, both in terms of distances, in terms of numbers of worlds, in terms of time scales. It it ranges in the tens of millions, hundred billions, even trillions of years in terms of and 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 planets. So that that is not at all. Uh, that wouldn't come as a surprise to a Hindu reader or hyperbole. Yeah. Yes, right, right. Mm. And, and just to keep leaping ahead from. From huge subject to huge subject, this is in 11 in, in 33. Yes. So stand up and gain honor. After conquering enemies, enjoy an abundant reign. I've already destroyed them. You who sling arrows from the left and the right, be an instrument and nothing more. And so this brings up fate, predestination. Uh, Krishna is saying... I've already won this battle for you, but but you have to now be the tool to do those things. 
Talk to me about about that whole sort of it's already been accomplished idea. So so what you're pointing to, Steve, is one of the 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 perennial universal problems of any theistic tradition, yeah. which is how much free will do we have and how much control does God have? This struggle is whether you study Christian theology or Hindu theology or, or any other theistic understanding of a supreme being who has all the power yeah. in the world. The question really, and, and this is connected to the problem of evil as well, is, is with given all that power, then how does he choose to use it? And why doesn't he help us in ways that we think he should be helping us, right? So that question of human free will and divine agency, that's a tough one. And the Bhagavad Gita really, when you took it, take it all together, it really leans on the sense of human agency because Krishna keeps telling Arjuna, do your dharma, do the action in the world. That action is going to shape your future and the future of others. But there are moments, and chapter 11 is probably the best example of that, where Krishna comes uh, forward and says, okay, now if you want to see things from my perspective, I've got this all figured out, right? This is, everything's under my control. All these worlds are rushing into my mouths, and there's nothing you can do. And that goes back to the whole awesome, awful aspect of it all is, Maybe we don't want to see it from God's perspective, right? And that's, that's what Arjuna comes to at the end. He says, I don't know if I want to see this perspective. I, I, I like the human perspective. This is what I can handle. This is who I am. Yeah. Can, well, I, can I read a verse oh, yeah. for you? Just because we're in chapter 11. Yeah, this yeah. is some of the most beautiful poetry that you find in the Bhagavad Gita. So if I can just read one verse for you. We can read the one that, that you just uh, pointed to, which is text 33. 33? Yeah. Do you want this or do you want... You're reading this? Sanskrit? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. So this won't be in, in, in your um, copies there, but uh, it, it sounds like this. jitva shatrun bhunkshvarajyam samriddham and that line, that last line is very famous. Nimitta matra bhava which means you just be an instrument. And even as that sounds very fatalistic, think about how important it is for an instrument to do its work well, right? Like if I'm playing the flute, or if I'm playing a piano and the instrument isn't properly tuned and the keys are all out of order and the strings don't work, that the, whoever's playing it cannot express themselves, right? So even if we think of God as expressing his will through us in the world, we have to do our bit, right? We have to be the instrument and being an instrument is no simple thing. Well, this ties back to that idea of not clinging to. If you're the instrument... You do what is required and what you've been trained to do, um, and you're, you're not really looking at the results. You're just performing, right? So, so this that yeah, that ties in really nicely. Thank you for for doing that for <laughs> us. And so, is that, that part of so the tradition wonderful. that it's chanted in a certain way, not just read? Yes, there are many Hindus who will memorize a chapter, their favorite chapter. Um, and they will memorize it and they will recite it every day. Or there are many who will recite one chapter every day, a different chapter. In fact, the birthday of the Bhagavad Gita, the day it was spoken, is coming up. This year it's on Christmas, December 25th. Interesting. And No, December 22nd, sorry, a few days before Christmas. And, uh, and on that day, many, many Hindus will sit down and recite in Sanskrit the whole thing. Oh, wow. Do you have a favorite verse or chapter like that? Oh, I've got so many. It's very, <laughs> okay, okay. It's very difficult. But, but maybe we can go to those uh, final teachings at the end because I really love those okay. and I'm happy to recite those. So we've been in Discourse 11 where Krishna reveals himself in a form to Arjuna that even many of the other gods, he says, have not seen. Mm. Um, and then he says, that's about enough. Yes. Uh, as much as I can take of that. And then we get to 12, and Ashton, I think you picked 12. Yes, I did pick 12. 
Um, and 11 really leads into what I want to talk about nicely at the end in verse 54, the second to last of 11, it says, Arjuna, I can only be known by devotion that has no other object. In this way may I be truly known and seen and reached, a scorcher of the enemy. And then at the beginning of 12, Arjuna is a little confused. He asks this clarifying question. From what I understand, he says, well, so are you saying that the ones who are completely joined to yoga, who are in this in this path of knowledge, and are they the ones who you, most honor you, who are best for you, who you um, hold the dearest? And Krishna explains to him that the path of knowledge is difficult, even though it might bring you the closest. And Ravi, correct me if I'm uh, understanding this wrong. And he says, but the path of devotion um, can bring you close to me as well. And, and that is just as beautiful. And then he has in the 12th discourse, these verses that stuck out to me more than any other section of the book. Just as I was reading them, I was just struck by their beauty. They're beautiful. They're amazing to read. And I'm sure it's even more beautiful without the translation, but the English was amazing as well. And because verses 13 through 20 just describe these characteristics of a devoted one, of one who is perfectly devoted to God, who is giving their all, their focus to Krishna. Um, the first verse of this section, verse 13, especially stuck out to me. One who has no hatred for any being, a compassionate friend, without the sense of mine, without making an eye, one who is patient, for whom pain and pleasure are the same. And that was beautiful to me because it describes this complete selflessness, this complete devotion, this complete love for God. And especially the last part, which says, for whom pain and pleasure are the same. Really, all these verses are about this complete equanimity, this complete um, center where you are never pulled too far in any direction and you're always able to find center again. And I, yeah, I just want to know if you want to talk about that. Yeah, those verses are really beautiful. They're among my favorites as well in the Gita. I have a lot of favorites, but but this uh, this series, I, I forget, it's like eight or nine verses, something like that. Eight verses, yeah. And uh, there, each of those verses ends with this um, statement by Krishna. He says, Same Priya, that, that person is really beloved to me, mm-hmm. right? Is loved by me. That person is dear to me. And and you really see this understanding of a of a human being who has given their lives to devotion and what kind of character they embody, what type of person they are, and how Krishna then extends himself in love to them. So those qualities, they their 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 moral qualities, their ethical, their ways of action in the world, their ways of being, um, and their ways of loving, right? And all of those are wrapped up in these eight very beautiful verses. I love the point that Ashton makes about equanimity and how pain and pleasure are the same. I want to go back to the sixth discourse really fast, just because I was confused when I was reading. Like, should we be acting or should we not? Because he's kind of saying both. <laughs> you and Arjun are both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, And so in the sixth discourse, verse 13, this is the imagery that for me makes the most sense in terms of action. And he's talking about how you hold your neck up and you hold your head up, but you're just looking at the tip of your nose. You're not looking around and searching for something. You're just kind of poised. And I like that imagery because it makes sense that you're doing something, you're moving, holding yourself in balance, but you're not actively searching or moving. You're just holding yourself. And and Krishna uh, tries to work out that that dichotomy that you mentioned about do you act or or do you not act in in the first verse of the sixth chapter where he says the person who is truly equipoised who is truly renounced who is truly not acting is the one who acts without attachment to the fruits not a person who doesn't light a fire or who doesn't do any work lighting a fire like is in other traditions as well, is often a symbol of work itself mm-hmm. because to do anything, you need to light a fire, whether it's an ignition or it's a light switch or whether it's keeping yourself warm or it's cooking your food, you have to light a fire. And Krishna says, someone who doesn't light a fire, that's not the person who's actually not clinging, not attached. It's the, the, the approach you take 
to your actions. It's the mood, the mentality with which you act in the world without attachment for the fruits. That's what makes you equipoised, not someone who just, who just kind of, you know, wants to escape from the world or pull away from it. Well, I feel like we should in the 12th, I feel like we should go through these verses because they're wonderful, right? Um, so I'll just start in 13. One who has no hatred for any being, a compassionate friend, without the sense of mine, without making an eye, and that comes up a lot. Um, and as interesting to think about, one who is patient for whom pain and pleasure are the same, the practitioner of yoga who is always content, whose self is controlled, and whose resolve is firm, whose power of insight and mind are fixed on me, who is devoted to me, that one is dear to me, the one in whose presence the world does not tremble, and who does not tremble in the presence of the world, who is free from pleasure and impatience, fear and anxiety, is also dear to me. The one who is able, pure, and impartial, who sits apart, whose anxiety is gone, who leaves off all endeavors, who is, in, who is devoted to me, is dear to me. The one who neither rejoices nor resents, neither sorrows nor lusts, letting go of states both happy and unhappy, filled with devotion, is dear to me. The one for whom enemy and friend... Honor and infamy, cold and heat, pleasure and pain are the same, who has moved away from clinging, the one for whom cure, oh, sorry, pardon, the one for whom curse and praise are equal, who keeps silent, content with whatsoever, whatsoever comes his way, without home, with steady mind, full of devotion, that one is dear to me. Those who honor the nectar of dharma spoken in this way, holding trust, holding me as highest, devoted to me, are very dear to me. Is that almost a blessed are the peacemakers, mm -hmm. blessed are the poor in heart, blessed are the kind well, of a listing of, of right. admirable characteristics, yeah. useful. To me, it seems like we're, he's placing us like, he, you could feel this way in a situation or you could feel its opposite, but mm. neither are actually the best way to be in that situation. Uh, let go of the extremes. And like, you know, be centered. That's that's what I'm getting from it. What do you think? Yeah, when I was doing a little more background reading on this section, I found um, that in the Hindu tradition, this is the, the this section is often considered as nectar, as the sweet nectar they refer to it as, and that really spoke to me. Just it's considered sweetness. Mm -hmm. The section in this sweetness that's at the middle of all of these, all these different opposites. There is there is that sweetness in the center. I, I really love that one phrase uh, from Patton's translation about he in front of whom the world does not tremble and who does not tremble before the world. That word tremble is really, really beautiful. Thinking about how there's no reason why others should tremble before us, right? That when, we, when we're coming at the world in this balanced way without the extremes of great anger or great sadness, right, that we're in the middle, then people don't need to tremble before us. And that word tremble shows up later in the Gita as well in the element of, of compassion or grace. There's a beautiful word in Sanskrit about uh, meaning mercy or compassion. And the word literally means to tremble with someone, right? So don't make others tremble on your account. Don't tremble before others. Have courage. But tremble with people. When someone is feeling pain or suffering or happiness, then tremble with them. And that's the essence of empathy or compassion. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. We are in the middle of talking about the Bhagavad Gita, translation by Dr. Laurie Patton. And our guest today is Dr. Ravi, Ravi Gupta. We'll take a break here for just a second. This is In Good Faith, and we'll be right back. Hi, Stephen Cap Perry here, host of In Good Faith. Here's another podcast from our BYU Radio family of podcasts I hope you'll check out. What I love is real. You know that saying, real recognize real? That's Lisa on The Lisa Show. Lisa Valentine Clark is a comedian. She's a believer, a single mother. And on The Lisa Show podcast, you'll hear from the Council of Moms, a genius idea, which is actually one of my favorite parts of her show. 
and you'll hear about the challenges of life, parenting, mental health questions, social issues. Yes, you'll hear from experts, but also from people discussing their where the rubber meets the road life experience. It's The Lisa Show, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to In Good Faith. This is a book club edition, something we do every single quarter, and we're so excited, not this time to have a work of fiction or analysis, but actually talk about some actual scripture for millions, millions of people around the world, the Bhagavad Gita. Dr. Ravi Gupta is here with us. We're going to focus on maybe some of these ending chapters and summations. One that I just had to mark in my in my own copy was in this 18th discourse, uh, 55. Are these verses? I've heard. Yes, they're verses. It, what does shloka mean? It means a verse, but a verse in a particular metrical rhythm, oh. which has eight um, syllables per quarter. Okay. Oh, okay. That makes sense because she talks about in her footnotes the lines being up to eight, but not more than eight, right? right. And I was exactly. like, why eight? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but now I get it. <laughs> so something just struck me in 55. Through devotion to me, one comes to know how far I reach and who I truly am. And then when one knows me truly, one enters me in an instant. Mm -hmm. This sort of spiritual epiphany and understanding that I wish I could have. <laughs> 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 that I'm, I want to be open to. Can you, you have more to say about these, these final summations, but if you want to refer to that, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yes, yes. No, that's, th this is why the, the ending verses uh, stand apart even from chapter 18, the last chapter, is because things are really, if we think of the Gita as a symphony, there's things are really reaching a crescendo here. And Krishna is really, um, he's, he's, he's looking at Arjuna. He can see that things are changing for him. His perspective is changing. And he's able to say things and reveal himself in a way that he hasn't. Mm -hmm. Notice how different that verse sounds that you read from chapter 11, right? Krishna, in the final verses, he's personal, he's intimate. And what's striking is that although most Western readers of the Bhagavad Gita Think of 11 as the climax of the Gita um, because that's where God has this incredible self-revelation. Is that what Oppenheimer quotes too? Exactly. When he sees the, the atomic bomb explode, yeah, yeah. right? He, he quotes that verse, time I am or death I am, the destroyer of these worlds. Uh, but most Hindus don't see chapter 11 as anywhere close to the climax of the Gita because it's an, uh, it's an understanding of God that is truthful but not accessible to human beings. And so if we think of God as being transcendent and accessible both, or, or, or powerful, awesome and sweet as well, then by and large, the readers of Bhagavad Gita in India have preferred God as the sweet one, the one who, is, who, who Ashton pointed out in chapter 12, keeps saying, he's dear to me, he's dear to me. That's the God who's accessible to us. And that's his true essence. If you look at the structure of the Gita, which Krishna... Is, which is maybe why Krishna is there in a form that's understandable. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why in 18, Krishna actually says, this is the climax of my teaching. So Hindus take that as the climax rather than 11, where Krishna doesn't really indicate as that being the climax. In fact, it's the middle of the Gita, not the climax. Huh. What do you love about this final, not a farewell, but this final sort of a summation before the big battle? Yeah. Um, as as we were discussing um, earlier before the show, I I I love its particular location in the Gita. Krishna has finished everything he has to say, and he tells Arjuna, "Yatechasi tatakuru." Now do as you like, and my teaching is done. And uh, you know, it's, it's a it's a long running joke amongst Hindus. When asked what's their favorite verse in the Gita, they say this one: "Do as you like." Do as you like. <laughs> <laughs> so, Krishna tells Arjuna, "Think about what I've told you, and then do as you like." And and after he says that, then he says, "But hold on, 
Let me tell you again what my highest teaching is, my most secret teaching. And I'm repeating myself here because I really love you, and I care so much about you, and I want you to do the right thing. And so that structure really points, the Gita itself points to these verses as being very significant. Um, and uh, that's uh, chapter 18, text uh, 65 and 66, and maybe I can read the Sanskrit, and one of you can read the translation. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, so it starts, well, let's let's back up from 65, just one more verse, and um, um, he says, in, uh, let's go to, to do as you like in 63, okay? We'll start there. He says, iti te gnanam akhyatam guhyad guhyataram maya so this wisdom told to you by me is more hidden than the hidden, and when you have pondered this completely, then do as you like. Sarva guhyatamam bhuya shunume paramam vacha ishto simedridhamiti tato vakshamite hitam Ashton? Even further, listen to my highest word, the most hidden of all. You are greatly loved by me, so I will speak for your benefit. And then the teaching itself, 65. Manmana bhavamad bhakto madhyaji mam namaskuru mam evaishyasi satyam te pratijane priyosime. Devoted to me, keep your mind intent on me. Give honor to me and sacrifice to me. In this way, you will truly go to me. I promise, for you are my beloved. And the final climax, we have to leave for Steve here. Sarva dharman parityajya mame kam sharanam vraja aham tvam sarva papebhyo moksha yishyami ma shucha Letting go of all dharmas, take me alone as your place of rest. And do not grieve, because I will free you from all evils. And that's it. And once that happens, then um, Krishna gives some wrap-up points about who this teaching is meant for and why it's important to study it. Uh, and then uh, Sanjaya, the narrator, comes around and says... Um, this has been incredible, and I, I don't know what I did to deserve to be able to listen to this dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. And is this supposedly a historical person, this narrator? Yeah, so Hindus understand Krishna and Arjuna and Sanjaya all as historical personalities, but not within the scheme of history as we chart it out. Mm. Uh, we might say trans-historical, that they exist both eternally on a divine plane and appear on earth as avatars or descend on earth, as Krishna describes earlier in the Gita, where he says, I descend to this earth regularly. Dr. Ravi Gupta, this is so much fun, actually, <laughs> if, that's, if I can use that word for, for, for learning. I, of course we can use that word for learning. But it's, it's very moving, these sections we've talked about. And I, I love how my eyes are open to how applicable it is to the different situations of our human situation. The, the different teachings and, and ways of being or ways of better not to be. And I think that's that's what makes Bhagavad Gita a classic of world literature. The classic, uh, the the nature of a classic, is that it's applicable across large periods of time, different cultures. It speaks to people, even when they're not directly born from the culture that produced that text, right? And that's what makes it a classic. And the Bhagavad Gita is one of those classics of world literature. So thank you for this opportunity to, to talk to you all about it. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed sharing the text with you.